So here we need to find the maximum concentration of an antibiotic during the first 12 hours. Notice when they say during the first 12 hours that we have a closed interval from zero hours all the way up to and including 12 hours. Because we have a closed interval, we're going to use the closed interval method to find this absolute maximum concentration. Now, in step one of the closed interval method, we need to find the values of our function at the critical numbers of our function. Now, critical numbers, of course, are obtained when we set the derivative equal to zero. So let's go ahead and look at our function, and we're going to talk about how to find the derivative. Now, our function involves these exponential terms here. For example, we have e to the negative 0.4t. So it's probably worth reviewing how we calculate the derivative of e to a constant times t with respect to t. Some of you may recall how to do this, but just a quick review. Basically, you recopy your function. So you'll have e to the kt, and then chain rule kicks in. You have to multiply by the derivative of kt. Well, k is a constant, t is the variable, so the derivative of kt would just be k. So basically, you're left with just k times e to the kt. So that's the rule we're going to apply when we do our derivative. So here we go. We'll have c prime of t. We have 8 as a constant multiple, so you might remember the constant multiple rule tells you to keep that constant, and then you're multiplying by the derivative of the inside here. Now, for this first term right here, we'll follow our rule. Our k is negative 0.4, and then we have our e to the negative 0.4t. Minus, and then our k in the next part is negative 0.6. Be careful, you're subtracting a negative 0.6. So in fact, that's just going to become a plus 0.6, and then e to the negative 0.6t. So there is our derivative. To find the critical number, we set the derivative equal to 0. So let's take our c prime of t and make that 0. To solve for t, we would want to divide both sides of this by 8 to cancel out the 8 on the right-hand side. Let's go ahead next and add the 0.4e term to both sides of this equation. Of course, that cancels it on the right-hand side. Next, we will divide both sides by the 0.4. Now, on the right-hand side, you're going to have 0.6 divided by 0.4. That's the same thing, of course, as 6 divided by 4. And if you reduce that, you get 3 halves. Moving along, we will divide both sides by the e to the negative 0.6t. Now, on the left side, let's be careful, because when you divide those e functions, you actually subtract their exponents. So you would have negative 0.4t minus a negative 0.6t. That is equivalent to negative 0.4t plus 0.6t. And when you add those together, you get 0.2t. So on the left side, we have e to the positive 0.2t is equal to 3 halves. We're almost there. We would take the natural log of both sides. The natural log and the exponential are inverse functions. They cancel each other out. So you have 0.2t is equal to the natural log of 3 halves. And then finally, we might wish to rewrite the 0.2 as 1 fifth. Those are equivalent. And that's kind of neat because in fractional form, we would multiply both sides by 5. 5 and 1 fifth multiply to 1, so we have 1t is equal to 5 times ln of 3 halves. This is our critical number, but we're still on step 1 because we still have to plug this critical number into the original function, so let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so we've gone ahead and plugged in our critical number into the function, basically replaced the t values with the critical number. Things get a little hairy here in trying to simplify it, but we'll do so very carefully. For example, we will multiply the negative 0.4 by 5, as well as the negative 0.6 by 5. The first one becomes a negative 2, the second a negative 3. Now we're going to use a property of logarithms here. We have this coefficient of negative 2 in front of our natural logarithm. Remember that you can actually move that up into a power position. The same thing with the negative 3. We're going to move that up into the power. So in the first case, we would have 3 halves to the power of negative 2. But another property of exponents kicks in here where you would flip the inside. You would get 2 thirds to the positive 2. So the negative power becomes positive when you flip the interior. And then you would have 2 thirds squared. So that would be 2 thirds times 2 thirds, which of course is 4 ninths. 
So that's something to keep in mind for the first case. For the second case, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to have three halves to the power of negative three. This would become two thirds to the positive three. Now we have two thirds times two thirds times two thirds, multiplying straight across in the numerator, two times two times two, of course, is, is eight. And in the denominator, we're gonna get 27. So that's a lot of exponent laws and manipulations, but when all is said and done, we end up with eight times e to the natural log of four ninths, and then minus e to the natural log of eight twenty sevenths. Now this is pretty nice actually, because look carefully, and once again, you have the exponential and the natural log as inverse functions. They cancel each other out. This gives you eight multiplied by four ninths minus, and then over here they cancel out, and you get eight twenty sevenths there. Almost there, we need to find a common denominator. Let's multiply this by three and this by three. This gives us 8 multiplied by 12 over 27 minus 8 over 27. With that common denominator, we can subtract the numerators. We get 4 27ths, and then we end up with 32 over 27. So let's just remind ourselves what this actually is. This is the concentration evaluated at our critical number which was the five ln of three halves. So this completes step one of the closed interval method. Let's hang on to this value right here. We'll refer back to it during steps two and three. Let's move on to step two next. It says to find the values of the function at the endpoints of the interval. So we've rewritten the endpoints along with the function. We would begin by computing c of zero. So we're basically just plugging zero in for t now. We would end up with e to the zero minus e to the zero. That, of course, is 0, so 8 times 0 is equal to 0. We would then plug in the right endpoint, so we would plug in 12. We would have 8 times. Now, when you plug in 12 right here, you'll have negative 0.4 times 12, which is negative 4.8. And then minus e, you would plug in 12 for t right up there, and that would give you negative 7.2. Now we'd want to use a calculator, of course, here. When you punch that into a calculator, you're going to get about 0.06. So we've done the values, or we've evaluated the values of the function at the endpoints. Let's move on to step three, which tells us that the largest of the values from steps one and two is the absolute maximum value. Now we only care about the maximum concentration. So let's look at the values from steps one and two. Remember from step one, we found the concentration at the critical number to be this value. You might wanna punch that into a calculator and realize that that's roughly 1.19. And then in step two, we found the values of the function at the endpoints of the interval. Now just ask yourself, which one of those three values is the largest? And of course it would be the 32 over 27. So that's our answer. That means that the max concentration on the interval from zero to 12 hours is that 32 over 27. And the unit of that concentration was micrograms per mil. So there is the final answer to our question.